So we've been talking about God's grace is for all people, and it's in all ways. And God's grace, we talked about the first week, we talked about God's grace gives faith. And the importance of what that looks like. When we see God's grace, it helps us to believe with who He truly is. The second thing we saw was that God's grace gives generosity. And so when we see that God's grace has been given to us, that picture of gift is a generous gift that God has given to us. So we see that through his grace and that generosity. And then last week we talked about God's grace giving us boldness and the importance of the boldness that we see in the life of Paul here now giving it to us and showing us as he's showing Philemon the importance of boldness and speaking the truth in love with grace. So this morning we see God's grace gives reconciliation. And so reconciliation is one of those big words of being brought back together in right relationship. And that's so important. But there's some real amazing things as we're going to finish out this book uh, that reconciliation does that is so far outside of what culture teaches us that it's just mind boggling to see that God has done that for us. So I look forward to, to in, just enjoying that together as we learn. And so our theme here this morning is this, is when grace provides reconciliation. It brings about salvation. Sorry, wrong theme. I did not connect that. So my apologies for that. When grace provides reconciliation, it brings about salvation. So this morning as we're diving in, looking at God's grace that saves us as we've been separated from Him for eternity, that salvation brings us back into that right relationship with Him. That's what salvation does. It's what salvation is. That Jesus gave His life for us so that we wouldn't have to pay the price for our own sins that wouldn't even measure up to what we needed to, to have a right relationship with God. Yet Jesus stepped in the gap, became the atonement for us so that when he gave his life on the cross it now becomes the ability for us to experience his grace and to see the reconciliation that comes about because that's next level salvation next level salvation is reconciliation it's part of salvation it's being brought back into right relationship with God and we'll be walking through that here this morning we see Paul is shows the relationship of Philemon and Onesimus again this is your first time with us we'll get you caught up a little bit with what's going on Onesimus has been brought back the desires for Paul and Philemon to uh, but Paul's encouraging Philemon to get back into right relationship uh, with Onesimus and Onesimus was his slave, and Onesimus was the one who stole from him and left him for good and said, no, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm not going to fulfill what, that, what I'm supposed to do. It was a one master, one slave. Now, his, this slave steals and runs away. But I don't know if you've ever been in a sort of a relationship that, that someone has done something that has severed the relationship that you, you would desire to have and let maybe the, the relationship is not close like it once was. And so maybe there's been something that's happened in that relationship. Maybe someone that, that you did not like actually even became a close friend after time. Maybe those are the different ways that we can see reconciliation at work. I remember when I was, uh, I was a manager at a Home Depot, and I, I was working in a certain section in Home Depot. Um, I, had, I was moving up in their company or whatever, and, and uh, as, as I was um, working in this, we moved, I moved stores and went to the highest grossing store there in, in southeastern Virginia, and where the, the business was like crazy, crazy busy. And so I had this crew of 20 guys that I had to oversee. Now, again, here's me, right? Right? You see me now, but me at 25, when I was in charge of these 20 guys, was a lot different. And so it was a little, little bombarded by this, this um, pressure that came about with this high volume store that you need to make sure you have your P&Ls, all this kind of stuff all put together. Okay, here I am a Bible student talking about P&Ls. Okay, got it. So here we had this, and there was this guy that was just constantly against me. His name was Ernie. And this guy, he was just constantly, just for some reason, didn't like me. And I'm like, I, I, what have I done? What is there been something that in his life that has caused him to, like, there's this sever between this relationship. And, 
And so I just kept thinking, all right, Lord, what is it that you want me to show him to, to bring about a right relationship so that we can work well together, so that we can, you know, increase the profits of Home Depot, or whatever. But most importantly, I want to show him Jesus. That's it. That's my goal. And yeah, when I was working at Home Depot, that was, it was really important that I had that opportunity to show Jesus. And I really enjoyed those years because it really being bombarded with so much of what the world has to offer, yet the light that shines when Christ shines through us is huge, huge. And I'll tell you why. After working with Ernie for six months, all of a sudden, something switched. And he became my most important ally. And I was like, Lord, what is it that you're doing? And so I just went up to him one time. This is where, you know, the boldness we talked about last week. This is one of these bold moments. I'm like, all right, Ernie, what switched? Like, you know, we had a little animosity at the very beginning. What's, what's going on? He's like, he's like, look, I, he's like, I think maybe something that happened in the past that might have caused me to not desire that type of relationship with you just to be like, I just wanted to buck the system and I wanted to just make it as hard as possible for you to get out of here because I wanted someone that I trusted more. And I'm like, whoa. Okay, what, what is that? What is that that you're desiring to do? And he said, but I saw that your desire to, to grow and your desire to, to push no matter how hard I push back. He goes, there's something different about you, and I respect that. Huh. Huh. So here comes this reconciliation of this relationship that's so vital and so important. And I don't know about what it is with you, if, if you've had any kind of huge reconcilia reconciliation moments in your life that, that you've been wondering, all right, what is it going to take to, to, to move past that whatever animosity is between us? To be reconciled with that. And may, maybe, maybe it's you. Maybe in your heart of hearts, you're struggling with animosity to someone that you don't actually really desire any type of reconciliation with that person. And so here would be my, my question to you is, you've been shown that type of grace, and you've been given that type of reconciliation with your relationship with Jesus. If you have chosen Him as your Lord and Savior, there He has shown you that type of grace. Why wouldn't you as a follower of him, desire to po point that back to someone else. What we're seeing here, we're seeing as a life that has been changed for Christ. We see that in Paul. And now he is, again, we know about Philemon, this rich landowner that has lots of people that work for him. And he's a devout follower of Jesus, runs these different, uh, this church inside of his house. He's this type of person, but yet he has this distance relationship with Onesimus, who's this guy who just stole and ran away from him. And so, there's some obligations that come about that we're going to be looking at too. But how much more important is it for us to treat someone that, is, that has animosity against us, knowing that we ourselves have been changed and reconciled to the Creator because of Christ? It's important for us to understand this. So we're going to look at the first thing we see this morning is this, is reconciliation is a heart issue. Reconciliation is a heart issue, and we see that in verses 12 to 14. I'll read it this way. It says, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I do not want to do anything without your consent so that... Any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. So again, this is Paul writing this to Philemon, talking about his relationship, Philemon's relationship with Onesimus. And so he's like, look, I, I'm, I'm, I was going to send him back to you, and, and I, I would desire to even keep him, but I want it to be voluntary, not something that I force, but I want it to be something you'd be willing to give. So we see a heart issue here is to accept one back. Now, again, we know Onesimus is a slave. Slavery, different back then than what we appear it to be today, right? Slave is someone who owes you something that will work for it until their debt is paid, and then they're free to go. That's what slavery looked like in biblical times. So that's what we're looking at here. And so legally, 
with if a slave were to part, depart from their master and someone found them legally, that person had to be returned. If they found them and they knew of them being a slave that's left, their, their job was to go back. Okay? So Onesimus had, had run and he was running and into Paul and he comes to know Jesus. So Paul says, you need to go back. So Paul sent Onik, Onesimus back. Again, this is legally a part of what he's supposed to do. Paul knows that Onesimus is supposed to go back to Philemon. But before he does that... The encounter that Paul has with Onesimus, Onesimus comes to know Christ. Onesimus comes to know Christ, and so his life is now changed. And then we see the second part here is we see in verse 12, we see the word heart. And so the word heart in verse 12 is also the same heart that is in verse 7. And so it's the emotions that come about with it. And so we've read about that and we talked about it in the second week here that Paul is sharing his love and care for Onesimus. And Paul is disciplined and discipled and led Onesimus to the Lord. I don't know if you've ever had that type of relationship with someone where you had the opportunity to disciple someone or maybe someone has discipled you and you know that relationship I've been discipled by multiple men I can tell you this my relationship with those men and I've discipled multiple men my relationship with those men is next level special because you're intimate with one another. You're desiring this relationship with one another. You're vulnerable with one another. Because we see the reconciliation that's been done in me that God's trying to do in them. We see that we are starting to develop the same heart. And that's what this is talking about. That same heart. Because Paul even says, look, look, I'm going to send him back to you. I don't even want to. Because he's very helpful for me. And I desire him to be with me because he's doing so much for the gospel that we want to see him continue to do this great work. He became an amazing soldier for the gospel. But Paul wants Philemon to recognize the change as well as see the change. Paul is hoping for a, a heart change in Philemon because he knows, all right, this guy stole from him and went away. But I'm sending him back, and I want you to see the change that I've seen in him. And I want you to see that it's not just a change of heart, but it's a change of complete character. Because that's what reconciliation does. Paul is hoping that this heart change in Philemon, it takes place. So Paul sends this letter back with Onesimus, okay? So it's like, well, he's not sending a letter before Onesimus goes back, he's sending it with him. And so when Onesimus walks back into the presence of Philemon, he hands him this letter that Paul's written, handwritten to him. So he's not like, okay, like, all right, you stole from me, and like, what's, what's up now? No, he's, he gives him a letter that's written by someone that he trusts and said, all right, this is who he is now. And I want you, it's like a, it's like one of those redemption cards that you hand in to someone. It's kind of like the, the fact of the blood of Jesus being sought on us as followers of Christ when we enter the kingdom of heaven. Something we do not deserve, yet we have been changed by what Christ has done us. That when Jesus looks down on us and he sees the atoned blood for, of Jesus on us, we get to walk freely. That's what this letter was to Philemon. It's to show him, look, I'm desiring you to see this heart change in Onesimus because I want to see a heart change in you. And so what is this heart change that he's talking about? This, this right relationship, this reconciled relationship with him. Well, it, it, it's important that we see that Onesimus himself was changed because he came, became a great man. And if you follow later in church history, we'll see about 50 years later when Ignatius, who was this being transported into Antioch, um, it was transported from Antioch to Rome, was getting ready to be executed. And he was writing these letters to these churches. So again, this is church history. And, and so what, one of the things that he writes to the church of Ephesus, this is after Paul, he praised the Bishop Onesimus. And he even used, it's really interesting, this is how we know it's the same Onesimus, even though they're doing the last names then, right? So this is how we know it's the same Onesimus, because he used the same pun that Paul used in the book of Philemon in the letter. 
He used the same pun, pun. He says, he was not useful, but now he is useful. <laughs> that same pun that Paul uses in Philemon in this letter, we now see Ignatius is writing the same thing. It's to show this is the same guy. And this is the work that Christ has done in and through his life. That's how we know that reconciliation is a heart issue. And that God has worked that heart issue out in Onesimus. And now Paul desired Philemon's heart to be right also. All right, so that's how we know reconciliation is a heart issue throughout this book. The second thing we see is that reconciliation is countercultural. It's counterculture. We see that in verses 15 and 16. Read this with me. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Okay, so what is this reconciliation that Paul's talking about between Philemon and Onesimus? This is talking about this countercultural move that Paul's asking Philemon to do. Okay, here's your slave back. I told him to go back home. He's now back home. He has been changed by the work of Jesus Christ in his life. He is no longer your slave. He's now your brother. What? So, like, for you and for me, we read that and we're thinking, okay, well, I mean, that's, that makes sense. A brother in Christ, we got it. Someone who owes you something, who has not paid you back something, is actually stole from you, is now told you're supposed to forgive them and you're supposed to move on. That type of reconciliation. See, last week we talked about boldness, and this is the epitome of boldness. This is where Paul asks for Philemon to take him back. But see, his, next, his, his request was next level because he asked him to be a brother. You see, in those days, to have a servant-master relationship, to be a brother relationship, was unheard of. Unheard of. It didn't happen. And it was, he had every right to throw him in prison for what he had done. That's what he deserved. But he said, no, 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 I want, you to, I want you to forgive him. And I want you to move on because there's other fish to fry here, okay? So let's move on here. See, Paul wasn't just asking for no punishment, but rather Philemon to make Onesimus a member of his family. What? He says, no, no, no. Okay, I know he owes you this. I'm not saying he's not going to pay you. I'm telling you that I want you to start treating him as your brother. I want you to invite him over for meals. I want you to sit at your table. Whoa. That's a big ask. And it's a bold ask. But see, Paul was trying to teach Philemon something here very important. He's saying no longer are they master-servant relationship, but brothers in Christ. Now, we see that that was countercultural then, and that's actually countercultural today. Very much so. So I was reading this story about this, this idea of how this reconciliation becomes countercultural. And I read this World War II story of this soldier named Lomax, who was a prisoner of war in Japan during World War II. And, uh, and another gentleman by the name of Nagasi. Nagasi was a Japanese soldier. So Lomax was this, was this soldier who was building these railways as a prisoner of war in Japan. And during this time of these different railways that were being built, 83,000 soldiers died in the production of making these railways in Japan during World War II. And so Lomax was part of this building these railroads in Japan. And so he was a, a prisoner of war during this time. And once he was released, his desire was to punish every Japanese officer during that time he was incarcerated. So his job was to get them back because that's what they deserved. And so Lomax, once he was released, he joined this organization to find these Japanese men, these soldiers. And he was successful at finding all of them but one. The one's name is Nagasi. 
And once he ended up finding him, he had a conversation with him, and they found that they had things in common during this time. One is that they, they had just evil dreams during the World War II time when they were incarcerated, when, when Lomax was incarcerated, and Nagasi was hold, helping to hold those captive. They realized that they both suffered from PTSD during that very time. And Nagasi was actually trying to find the bodies of the 83,000 men that died and have them returned to their families to pay restitution. Hello, wasp. All right. So he's trying to find all these 83,000 and, and to return them to their families to pay restitution for what he had done. When Lomax understood his heart and this connection at the time, they spent the next 18 years becoming the best of friends. Once desiring death, his enemy became his brother and his friend. See, that's a major, major reconciliation story. And for us to understand that there's actually one that's even greater than that. And that's the reconciliation that we have with Jesus. Because Scripture talks about us that once we were enemies of Christ, there he died. Because the things that we do wrong add up to the reason he went to the cross. We ourselves put him there. The reason he went to the cross, yet while we were enemies, he died for our sins. That is the greatest story of reconciliation there possibly is. And it's countercultural. And so understanding this, now Paul writes a lot when it comes to this understanding of what reconciliation brings. So it goes against everything in the culture of our time and in our time, right? So this is what it brings about. It goes against all these things. So destroying one another or anything that is different, that is what our, that is what our culture teach, excuse me, teaches us when it comes to relationships. If they don't agree with you, if they don't vote for you, if they don't look like you, then they're your enemy. That is the furthest thing from what God's Word says. God's Word says this, that our culture, well, first it says that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What? I, no, like I, can, I can deal with them, but to love them? Yeah. And to the pray for those who persecute you. What? Reconciliation is countercultural. And it's exactly what Christ is calling us to do as followers of Him. You see, our culture can't handle that type of thinking. They can't handle that type of talking. It's countercultural, and that is what brings, what reconciliation brings, and it deserves to be lived out. The third thing we see here is that reconciliation is to be lived out. We see this as we finish out this book. We're just going to be finishing verses 17 to 20 here. And it says this, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart. In Christ. There's so much in this verse. There's so much in this. So we understand one thing about Paul, right? That Paul is a gospel saturated man. He is a gospel saturated man. It means that every avenue of his life points back to Jesus. Every avenue of his life points back to what Christ has done for him. And every opportunity that Paul has to show what Jesus has done for him, he points it out in every relationship that he has. 
So when he is going before Philemon and saying, take him back. If there's anything that he owes, like, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. Why? Because Paul understood reconciliation. You see, the response that he gives is proof that Paul understood reconciliation. You see, he experienced the gospel. His life was changed by the gospel. He served and shared it with every single person he came in contact with. You see, when Paul met Jesus, his life was changed, and he knew others' lives would be changed also. It's even so important that we understand how much Paul understood reconciliation that even if you go back to the, into history, you'll see that the disciples were scared to death of Paul. They were terrified of him because they knew where he came from. They knew his background. They understood this. They were scared. But, but when they saw the Paul that Jesus had reconciled, everything was fine. Oh, okay. So you did meet this guy we've been hanging out with for the past three years. Got it. That's great. You see, 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, that is in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, so that's huge for us to understand this. Paul's writing about reconciliation because he understood it. And he writes, what does he write about it? He says the way that people are going to understand reconciliation is that it is being lived out in your life. That's the way that they're understand it. You're not going to be able to define it with words unless you're defining it with action. And that's the very essence of what Paul is saying. If secondly, Philemon is the only book that Paul wrote that does not mention Jesus' death and resurrection. Do you know why? Because he was writing about it in the bringing back a relationship that should have been severed because of sin that took place. And he stood in the gap because he was living it out. Because he is acting it out in the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. See, Paul says anything that, that he owes, I will pay. Isn't that what Jesus does? Anything that we owe because of our own life, Jesus paid for it. He paid for it all on the cross. That's where we see it's the, most, it's the most greatest equalizer in all circumstances. The cross is the greatest equalizer in all circumstances. We see, secondly, this, this partner, which is koinonia, which is this relationship being restored. It's what koinonia is, a right relationship between brothers. It's a beautiful picture, and it's what the church is called to be, to have this type of relationship with one another. Paul is being Christ in the relationship, and wants Philemon to see that all are equal, and now you're all brothers. He is no longer your slave. He is now free to go, and anything he owes you, I'll pay for it. <laughs> little sidebar here, right? What kind of audacity would Philemon have to say, okay, well then you owe me this. Here's your invoice. <laughs> There's no way Philemon would do that to Paul. No way. Paul knew that. Paul knew that. That's what he says. He said, I do wish that that for my benefit, that from the Lord, or no, I'm sorry, the one right before that, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Whoa. We understand this in Colossians 3.11, there is not a Greek or, and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. This is what koinonia brings about. It's what this partnership brings about. It's what the cross brings about. And then lastly, there's implications of the gospel are personal, never private. 
You see this new humanity of equal partners that they see within this relationship of Philemon and Onesimus. It's so important that we understand this. Why? Because we see that they are now sharing together in God's healing mercy. Now that they're both allowing, right? So Onesimus is allowing Philemon to forgive him, right? That's important. And Philemon is now forgiving Onesimus. That's important. Koinonia. That's what brings it together. But personally, we are held accountable to the work Christ has done on the cross, recognizing that is the atonement of our sin, and we are to worship Him accordingly. That's what our response is to be. We're held accountable for it. Because as we have been saved, if we have been changed, as we have been reconciled, is our lives changed because of it? Do we, are we different because of it? If our lives look the same as the world, then where has the gospel changed our lives? I mean, a lot of us, maybe you're really discouraged by what took place this past week with an election. Maybe you are, but I'm here to tell you this. What does it change? For the gospel of Jesus Christ is, continues to be proclaimed. And I will tell you this. Maybe, maybe this is what God wants. And maybe it's greater time for his light to shine in us than ever before. Because the darker the world becomes, the brighter his light's going to shine. Amen. Reconciliation is to be lived out. And that is our duty as followers of Jesus Christ. So how does that happen? Remember this, that Christ also brings vulnerability. Grace brings about vulnerability. It means that we have to share life with one another. And we might not view things all the same. We might not see everything the same. We might not even see scripture the same. But I will tell you this, we are still called to be brothers and to have the partnership of Koinonia together. And that's important. Why? Because we need to be vulnerable with one another. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this. We are to be personal in the way that we live life. Personal. It means that we have to be willing to share life with one another. We have to be willing to care for life with one another. We are be willing to give to one another. We are willing to receive with one another. That's a big one. We all like to give, but how many like to get? Well, I mean, I like to get, but how many are willing to let other people give to us? No, 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 no. God's going to bless me. He's going to give me something, just not going to use you. What? That's not how this works. Receive it. Receive it. And thank, in thankfulness, but also in thankfulness. Because God's in the middle of all of these things. And we, in receiving, we're also opening up our lives to one another. As we close this book of Philemon, I want us to understand this, that God's grace gives us salvation that reconciles our hearts to the creator of the universe. Let us allow the world to see our countercultural life as we live it out all loudly for all to see. Key word, loudly. Let his light shine through you as we share the great love of Jesus Christ that has saved our lives. We respond in it in this way. When grace provides reconciliation, it brings about salvation. Let's pray together.